Solo, A Star Wars Story is pulling back the curtain on the formative years of our favorite space pirate and throwing a huge hydro spanner in the complex Star Wars canon. The expanded universe is gone, but certainly not forgotten, and the new movie seems to be taking bits and pieces from the old backstory to create an all-new, Disney-approved continuity. I thought we were in trouble there for a second, but it's fine. We're fine. Oh! I'm Moose, and today I'm taking a look at the behind-the-scenes history and EU origins of these smugglers, thieves, and scoundrels, all to paint a picture of how Han, Chewie, and Lando became heroes. Since he's the titular star of the show, let's start with Han Solo. The character that became Han Solo wasn't a smuggler in the early drafts of Star Wars. He was a member of the Jedi Bendu and an old war buddy of the elderly general, Luke Skywalker. Also, he was a giant green alien with gills. Lucas realized that his hero needed some humanity, and by the third draft, he devolved into a tough, James Dean-style cowboy in a starship. Simple, sentimental, and cocksure of himself. I think you just can't bear to let a gorgeous guy like me out of your sight. I don't know where you get your delusions, laser brain. He was the perfect foil to Luke Skywalker's childlike naivete, and with the character solidified, the question turned to who would play him. Lucas auditioned soon-to-be stars like Christopher Walken and Kurt Russell, but none of them had that solo swagger. The only guy who did was the one Lucas hired to feed them lines, a moonlighting carpenter by the name of Harrison Ford. The two had worked together on American Graffiti, and he was the perfect fit for the swashbuckling, spacefaring scoundrel. There have been hundreds of thousands of words written about the life of Han Solo, most of which are no longer canonical, and you have wasted your time by reading them. Non-canonical, 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 non-canonical. But we shouldn't throw the old backstory out with the bathwater. The movie promises to show us how Han Solo got his name. Thank God. But in the old canon, he was actually born with blue blood in his veins. Not literally, but he is descended from the House of Solo that ruled the Corellia system in ancient times. Han was left to fend for himself on the mean streets when his parents, Joan Ash and Jaina, vanished until a hardened crook named Garrus Shrike took him under his wing. He was a cruel mentor who abused and eventually tried to kill Han when he wanted to sit down on his own, kind of like Yondu in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, but not Volume 2, where he's much sweeter. I'm Mary Poppin, y'all! Solo bounced around the galaxy for a while until enlisting in the Imperial Academy, where he was commissioned as a TIE pilot under the command of a sadistic slaver named Nyklas. Han turned traitor to save the life of an enslaved Wookiee, which was an act of bravery that got him booted from the service. I was kicked out of the flight academy for having a mind of my own. But did earn him the right to wear the Corellian blood stripe on his space trousers. If you don't know what that is, it's just a little stripe on the outside of his pants because nerds had to justify 70s fashion choices by coming up with elaborate lore. The newly liberated Wookiee swore a life debt to his savior and from then on, Han was never far from his trusty co-pilot, Chewie. When George Lucas was writing Star Wars, he owned a 130 pound Alaskan Malamute named Indiana. We named the dog Indiana who may be one of the most important dogs in movie history. For one thing, she had the perfect name for an ass-kicking archaeologist. And second, driving around with his furry friend in the passenger seat inspired George to create a co-pilot for Han Solo. Makeup artist Stuart Freeborn stitched together a suit made of goat, rabbit, and yak hair. Will somebody get this big walking carpet out of my way? While sound designer Ben Burt combined the squeals of tigers, bears, camels, badgers, and walruses to create Chewie's guttural growls. Well, you said it, Chewie. All they needed was a big ass Brit to bring into life. Lucas offered the part to six foot six bodybuilder David Prowse, but he decided to play Darth Vader instead. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. And can you blame him? Uh, would you rather walk around in cool black armor and a lightsaber, or would you rather get fleas? You sleeping bubble! Only an overblown mophead like you would be stupid enough! Luckily, Lucas discovered a 7'3 hospital orderly named Peter Mayhew, who nailed his audition by standing up. I'm raised in England. As soon as someone comes in through the door, I stand up. George goes, hmm. You're seven feet tall. Can't teach that. You're in. 
Mayhew played the Wookiee in five films until his retirement after The Force Awakens, and Chewie became one of the saga's most beloved stars, although apparently not beloved enough to deserve a medal. Forget medals though, because Chewie deserves a Lifetime Achievement Award for all the shit he's gone through. He was born 200 years before A New Hope, but the forests of his homeworld Kashyyyk couldn't hold him for long. He left for the stars, serving as a scout and navigator for a clan of Wookiees charting new hyperspace routes. Then the Clone Wars erupted and Chewie returned home to join the hashtag resistance. He fought bravely during the Battle of Kashyyyk, but after the droid army was defeated, the Emperor unleashed Order 66 and initiated the Jedi Purge. Chewie helped Yoda escape certain death, but he was powerless to stop the newly formed Empire from devastating his home planet. He roamed the galaxy for years, liberating enslaved Wookiees and leading uprisings whenever he could, until he was captured by a TIE squadron led by none other than Lieutenant Han Solo. Even after Han rescued Chewie, he resented the walking carpet for, I guess, costing him his dream of being an evil, jackbooted fascist. But Chewie's knack for repairs and knowledge of hyperspace shortcuts, remember those, made him an invaluable first mate, and soon the two became best friends. Despite being a galactic outlaw, Chewie somehow found the time to return to Kashyyyk and start a family. And unlike most of the stuff in this video, his wife Mala, son Lumpy, and his good old father Itchy are still canon. One thing that will change with Solo though is the way Han and Chewie get their spectacular ship. Although it's not gonna change that much because it's still coming courtesy of Lando Calrissian. Lando is one of the most unique citizens in the Star Wars galaxy, which is why it's so surprising that he was originally supposed to be a clone. In early drafts of The Empire Strikes Back, Lando Kadar was a leftover from the Clone Wars who lived in a colony populated by copies of himself. That element was axed, leaving the wars a cool little mystery until they were revealed to be a thrilling high stakes conflict over space taxation years later. This isn't how it's supposed to be. The character evolved into an intergalactic playboy. How can you not be pansexual in space? There's so many things. <laughs> There's so many things to have sex with. <laughs> and future Colt 45 spokesman Billy D. Williams was the perfect choice to put on the cape. There are two rules to remember if you want to have a good time. Rule number one, never run out of Colt 45. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. Second only, to Donald Glover, who at least an action figure for him rocks a mean cape. I like that it's blue on the inside. As for Lando's original backstory, we never really found out much about his formative years. He deliberately kept the details fuzzy in order to present the image of this larger than life legend. Everything you've heard about me is true. We do know that in his youth, he picked up Sabak. So this is uh, Sabak? Sabak. Sabak. Got it. Star Wars is answered at Texas Hold'em. Lando made a career out of the high stakes card game and amassed a fortune that extended far beyond credits. Four years before the Battle of Yavin, he won a rusty old YT-1300 freighter called the Millennium Falcon. One problem, Lando had no idea how to fly a spaceship. So he hired a smuggler named Solo to put him through pilot school. Han coveted the Corellian cruiser from the moment he laid eyes on her and bided his time until he could win the Falcon from his friend. Fair and square. And how you doing, Chewbacca? <laughs> she was Lando's favorite ship, but there were no hard feelings, at least initially. Although the two did have a falling out after a job that went south. You got a lot of guts coming here after what you pulled. Lando was broke after the botched mission and he was reduced to driving a taxi and delivering space beans. In Star Wars, you have, you have space spice, space cigarettes, space 50s diners, and space beans. During one job, he helped the people of Tanab fight off a fleet of marauding pirates, which made him a minor celebrity in the Star Wars galaxy. Well, look at you, a general, huh? <laughs> Someone must have told him about my little maneuver at the Battle of Tanev. And with his star on the rise, Lando gained entry into Cloud City's high roller casinos, where he caught the attention of their administrator. And he wound up winning control of the whole city in a single high stakes hand. I'm not that upset about the Empire taking over Star Wars because under the old system of democracy, you could win the mayorship of a city just by like beating the dude in cards. 
If you can't hold on to elected office because you're such a degenerate gambler, maybe you need the strength and security of an evil empire. <laughs> As for Han. It's Han, but that's okay. As for Han, Lando's buddy returned to his old racket. He found himself running glitter stim for a gangster called Jabba the Hutt across an infamously dangerous smuggling route known as the Kessel Run. Han and Chewie were pulled over by Imperials along the way and forced to dump their cargo of valuable spice. Even I get boarded sometimes. Knowing that his failure would put a huge target on his back, Han raced back to recover the goods, shattering the speed record by traversing the Kessel Run in under 12 parsecs, but it just wasn't fast enough. The goods were gone, Jabba put a huge bounty on Han's head, so he headed over to Tatooine to beg for an extension on his debt. But before he encountered the shitty CGI space slug, Han stopped in a cantina to whet his whistle. And that's when Chewie introduced him to an old man and this whiny, snot-nosed kid who were looking for safe passage to Alderaan without any Imperial entanglements. That's where we first met Han too, in 1977. And since then, the Star Wars backstory has expanded to a whole universe and collapsed into a corporate singularity. Millions of stories suddenly silenced, but no matter what origin you adhere to, the core appeal of Han Solo and his sleazy friends remains the same. Thanks for watching, everybody. I want to know, what do you miss most about the Expanded Universe? What was your favorite storyline? Did you like the new Jedi Order? Do you miss Tales from Mos Eisley Cantina? What do you want them to bring back into the new canon? Leave a comment, let me know, and while you're down there, please subscribe to Now This Nerd.